Ladies and gentlemen, dames en heren, um, my name is Martin Heyer, I'm the director of the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency and I welcome you to this PBL Academy lecture. This is going to be held by Arkon Fung of Harvard University. Um, PBL sees it as its role to uh, report to public policy makers news from science, from the academy. And we are searching for the most effective way in doing that. That means that we will continue producing reports, but more and more we find ourselves sitting at tables with policymakers to find out what the knowledge requests are that they feel, or of course the knowledge request we implicitly, implicitly supposed there should be and that we could deliver on. At this moment I think the Dutch national state as many other nation states is struggling with its role. It's searching for a new way of giving meaning to what the national government must do against the backdrop of a situation of less and less public resources and a need to make choices to make the budget meet, uh, meet. In that particular situation, it's by no means the case that there are less ambitions. Actually, there are public re requirements for the state to perform well. The public problems, after all, haven't become smaller, and PBL is, of course, responsible for the knowledge input on quite some substantial problems, whether it is how can we make the economy work better by doing spatial things? At what level does the economy cohere? What clusters and agglomeration effects can we distinguish, can we discern from what we see in reality? But obviously there is also the whole environmental agenda, most certainly not a small one. Now in our reflections on that, we see more and more that the role of science vis-a-vis -vis public policy making is changing. That while we are very good at making an analytical effort and trying to understand a problem up front, <laughs> it is actually in the enhanced interaction with the struggles, as we often say, of policy makers that we can help policy makers much more in doing what their responsibility is creating good public policy. And again, you see also that public policy makers themselves realize that they probably have to get their knowledge from elsewhere. We will do our best and we have our analytical models and modeling efforts, but policy makers also need to know much more empirical data about how what they try and do actually creates effects. What works well, what doesn't work well. And it is in that sphere, I think, that we are undergoing a, quite a revolution, which is based on two aspects. On the one hand, the technology that allows people to get, have access to knowledge and also to do what is basic sort of proto-policy analysis, okay? using data to make your own sum, so to say. And on the other hand, a request from society to be more involved. Now, the Netherlands obviously is not a country without a participatory tradition. We often refer to the Netherlands and its polder model, referring to the almost uh, DNA-based request and inclination to involve people of society in policy making, which is often attributed to our uh, struggle against uh, the water, of course, where the state could never do it on its own. So we do have a tradition, but again, it seems as if participation is changing its character as well. It is definitely not going to be only participation in what the states want to achieve. It's much more society-based. Society itself is having its 
public policy problem, so to say. It has its own concern about the quality of the lived environment, and it wants the state to act on that, and it also holds the state accountable for the lack of performance in that sphere. Now, having sketched that sort of hopefully slightly familiar real reality in which we do our work, either as academics or as policy makers or as people at the planning agency, or as citizens at large, it is a particular pleasure to welcome uh, to you Arkon Fung, who uh, has much to offer precisely in that domain. And I'll briefly sketch a few lines in, in his uh, thinking. I think if there is such a thing as the sociological imagination, which is the quality on the part of academics to really see sociological interconnections, then Archon is somebody who has something like a public policy imagination. How can public policy in this day and age recreate itself in, and, and increase its performance? He has that rare quality of both being analytically very sharp as well as very interested in what happens in society out there. The, the things that citizens invent, the things that we are not necessarily reporting on in our reports, but that he thinks should be taken into account. And there, I suppose, the internet and the possibilities of ICT has become increasingly important in his writing. So coming from also a line of thinking on participation, he has become more and more involved in trying to understand what uh, the digital revolution can mean for that. His last book, Full Disclosure, is on a problem that we are currently uh, addressing, I suppose, in, uh, in the Netherlands. What do we do with the possibility of using data information and access to data information as a public policy tool? And now he will talk to us uh, on the topic which I read out from the screen, why technology hasn't revolutionized politics, but how it can give a little help to our friends. It is ongoing work, and I think that's in the best academic tradition, to talk about what is in the forefront of your mind. And it's with utter delight that I call to the stage Arkham Fung for to give this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, it's a real delight for me to be able to talk to you this afternoon about some of my uh, insights and ongoing work in the area of technology and politics. And so thanks, Martin, and other colleagues at the PBL for creating this opportunity. Um, let me first say at the outset that this is a new line of uh, research in the intersection between technology and democratic governance, and so I very much look forward to your re reactions and ideas. And then let me also say that this is joint work that's uh, very, very joint. It's not just me, but uh, both the empirical and analytic uh, material that I'm going to discuss today is, was developed jointly by myself and two colleagues, uh, Holly Rusan Gilman, who is a uh, PhD student in the government department at Harvard University, and Jennifer Schabachtur, who is an SJD candidate at the Harvard Law School. This is uh, work on technology is a new line of research for me, and I think I probably first got started on it uh, out of interacting with students at the Kennedy School. And every week, or almost every week, there's a student who comes into my office and says, I have a fantastic idea about a technology, and I want to create a startup that will revolutionize politics and democracy. And once in a while, I think once over the last two years, I've actually thought the idea was a, a fairly good one. Um, but all the others have been terrible. And for reasons that are, that should be obvious, I think, that are obvious to me why this idea won't work, not obvious to them. So I, I, uh, it started me on a line of work thinking about uh, why some of these uh, intuitions that I have about technology and politics are not more broadly shared. And so I view uh, technology, the right way to think about technology and politics as right at the intersection of work on technology on one hand and then people thinking about technology, or I'm sorry, politics on the other. 
And there's been a lot of writing on the potential of ICTs to really enhance many dimensions of democratic governance, from citizen participation, to access to information, to political accountability, to understanding large data sets and making them more public. And the odd thing about this debate is that people disagree very, very much about the potential for technology to enhance politics. So people beginning from uh, the perspective of technologists and developers, at least in the United States, my perspective uh, reflects debates largely in the United States that may or may not have parallels here. I'd be interested to find that out. But people asking this question from the perspective of technologists are very, very enthusiastic about the possibilities of technology to enhance political life. They think that technology, the, revo the political revolution, will come uh, through technology and it's only a matter of time. And the role of technology and mobilization of young people in the election of uh, then-candidate, now President Obama, was uh, some evidence for them to support that view. On the other hand, political scientists who've looked at this question, there's not that many, but a few, are very, very skeptical about the possibilities of technology to enhance the quality of democratic life. So there's a very good book by Matthew Hindman called The Myth of Digital Democracy in which he looks at uh, the bloggers, people who write political blogs. You know, and we've heard a lot that uh, the internet is a democratizing technology because lots of people, you know, all you need is a phone or a laptop and you can start your own political blog. So it should be very, very leveling, should create lots of opportunities for people to have their say, express their political views. And so he did this part of his book, looks at the top 10 most popular political bloggers in the United States. And he looks at their resumes and their backgrounds, the universities they attended, the graduate schools they attended, and the list of the top 10 bloggers in the United States is more elite than the regular columnists in the New York Times and the Washington Post, probably than and the Financial Times both, right? So that's a piece of evidence that the blogosphere, at least the political blogosphere so far, has not been all that democratizing. And then you look at the rate at which uh, people use technology to participate in different kinds of political life, such as getting information um, or other kinds of engagement, and you find that uh, the, the, the kinds of inequality in participation, the digital divide, are even more great than face-to-face -face participation. That is, in face-to-face -face participation, if you go to a town meeting in The Hague or Amsterdam um, or Tilburg, where I just was, I guarantee you that the people who go to that town meeting will be more educated, more professional than everybody else in the population. Right? That's just a, a regular selection uh, bias, that self-selection bias that political scientists understand very well. If you look at participation on the internet, it's even more unequal than that, right? So political scientists look at all this data and say, the internet won't be democratizing, it'll probably enhance inequalities, right? So you have this huge disagreement. And so how do you think about that disagreement and um, how do you resolve it? And I would like to urge people to think about technology and politics right at the intersection of technology and politics, not from the political scientist perspective, but not from the technologist perspective either, but with one foot in both camps. And I, uh, this, this graphic I got from, uh, does anybody know who this is? <laughs> this is Steve Jobs. I'm, I'm addicted to uh, Apple technologies. Oh, I better use the microphone. And so I'm also addicted to Steve Jobs' public presentations. And I don't know how many other, other people spend their lunch hours kind of watching his public presentations. But a recent um, theme for the last three or four years is that what's special about Apple Computer as opposed to other technology companies is that Apple operates right at the intersection of technology and the liberal arts, right? So, you know, you look at Google or Dell Computer or whoever, and they think a lot about the technology. They're very good at that, but not about the humanist aspect, right? And so similarly, I think that um, there's a lot of progress to be made on this question of technology and politics. Uh, and, but that progress will be made by operating at the intersection between technological perspectives and political perspectives. So that's just by way of background. Now, 
The puzzle that I want to address in these remarks is why has there been no killer ICT platform in politics yet? So that's both a claim and a puzzle. So the claim is that there ha has been no revolutionary te technology yet in politics. And this is strange because there have been revolutionary technologies in our commercial life, right? So uh, Amazon.com, which uh, probably a lot of people use, has revolutionized the way that we buy books and buy movies. Netflix, which is a U.S. company, but you probably have an, uh, an analog here, has revolutionized the way through the Internet that we watch movies. Now you can, uh, instead of going to your video store and looking for a movie, you know, walking uh, a kilometer to the video store trying to find the movie, it's not there. Instead, you can just sit in your living room, type a few keys on your computer, press a button, and then the movie starts in a couple of seconds. And as a result, many of the uh, video stores have gone out of business. It's been a revolutionary politics, uh, rev revolutionary technology. Similarly, in social interaction, their ha technology has revolutionized the way that we interact with one another through social networking technologies like Facebook and Twitter. Even in the realm of production, especially the production of knowledge, technologies have uh, revolutionized the ways that we make things. So Wikipedia famously introduces an entirely new way to make knowledge instead of what it destroys is the Encyclopedia Britannica way, which is you know, hiring issue uh, area experts to write specialized articles and then publishing them in multi-volume encyclopedias. As you know, Wikipedia produces more articles that cover more issues of comparable quality just by inviting anybody who's interested in that issue to contribute and edit that article. It's a dramatically different way of producing knowledge that is enabled by technology. It's called the open source way or the wiki way. Linux, uh, do people know what Linux is? It's a Linux is, a, is an operating system that, uh, uh, that competes with Microsoft Windows and uh, the Apple operating system. It's produced through, uh, Linux stands for, uh, uh, well, the L comes from Linus Torvalds, who's the, the person who started it. Linux is an operating system that is developed through voluntary contributions much like Wikipedia, only instead of developing an encyclopedia, they're developing an operating system. And it said, it was said for a long time that Linux was more stable, more bug-free than its competitors through a very different, uh, very different system of production that looks much more like Wikipedia, less like Microsoft or Apple. It's not a company, it's a network of voluntary producers, right? So these are ways in which Internet and communication technologies of different kinds have revolutionized our life in the consumption sector and commerce, in the social sector, through social interaction, and in the world of production. But we cannot name a single platform like that in the political sphere. There has no, been no killer political application. And why is that? Many people think, on the, especially on the technology side, think that it's just a matter of time. Since technology has revolutionized interactions in all of these domains, it's only a matter of time before technology revolutionizes the political domain as well. Right? That's reasoning by an analogy. Commerce is like social interaction, is like production, is like politics. Technology must come to politics as well. I want to argue that the, tech, that the political realm is fundamentally different from these other realms in ways that make technological innovation in the realm of politics much slower and make a killer application in politics less likely. Um, first, what do I mean by, a, a, now a couple of framing remarks, what do I mean by a killer application? A killer application is a, dis a killer technology is a disruptive technology in the Schumpeterian sense. Schum Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter said that entrepreneurs destroy at the same time that they create. So he came up with this phrase, creative destruction, right? Every time they create one product, it destroys 
alliances to old products. Technologies operate in a similar way. There's a f uh, very, very nice book by uh, Tim Wu about information empires that uh, discusses the history of technologies and how one displaces another over time, over the you know, last 150 years or so. Um, so there are three features of killer technologies. One, first feature, is that many users adopt an ICT platform and an abandon their old way of doing something. So instead of going to the video store to rent your DVD or videotape, you just go to Netflix or some online iTunes, some online provider, right? That's the first feature. The second is that they do that because the information and communication technology improves their experience by changing the way that they do that thing. That's the second feature. And three, the third feature is important, Organizations that use the new technology displace the organizations that use the old one. So uh, a large chain of video rental uh, firms in the United States called Blockbuster is shrinking dramatically because it's been displaced by these uh, companies that use the new information and communication technologies. So that's what I mean by uh, uh, killer technology. Now, I want to say a little bit about uh, the empirical evidence that I'll pre present in a few minutes and kind of the level at which I'm asking this question about technology. Now many people who've thought about technology and politics focus on technology as a kind of social force that's uh, aggregate kind of uh, differences that it makes for political dynamics writ large. Some of these features are technology is said to lower communication costs. It lowers search costs. Think how much easier it is for you to find, uh, find out anything about anything through search engines like Google or Bing or Badu than, um, than it was before these large search technologies, right? Wide bandwidth allows more interactivity. They say that technology allows many-to-many -many communication rather than just one-to-one -to -one, like a telephone or one-to-many like a radio station or a television station. Instead, it allows many-to-many -many communication. Now, I won't consider technology at this level of resolution. Instead, I'll look at a lower level of resolution, more close to the ground, and consider particular information and communication technology platforms. Not ICT as a social force, but particular platforms like Facebook or Wikipedia or the Obama administration's Open for Questions or Recovery.gov or Ushahidi. I'll talk about those in a moment, but all of those are particular instances of information and communication technologies, not ICT writ large. Okay. So the first part of this argument presents a model of innovation, right? So just think, in any given year, if you go to Silicon Valley or other regions that are highly technological, uh, highly... Uh, uh, high-tech industry regions, they'll produce a certain number of innovations in a given time period, in a given month, in a given year, what have you. Some of those innovations will be killer applications. Sometime, you know, in one in five years, somebody will invent the iPhone or will invent Wikipedia, right? It'll be a low percentage, you know, maybe one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand or whatever. But then the number of killer applications, really important ICT innovations per time period is just kind of definitionally a product of the innovations per time period over the number of really killer applications per innovation. And here's the disanalogy part. I want to say that in commerce, the supply of innovation is very high. There's lots of entrepreneurs who want to create innovations and sell them to you. And the demand for innovation, that is you, want these things. You want the faster mobile phone, the better computer that's easier to use, the technology that makes it so you can start watching a movie immediately rather than you know, wait uh, a week, right? So you have a high demand for that. Also in the social realm, does anybody know who the second person is? This is Mark Zuckerberg, the person who created Facebook. Um, in the social realm, the supply of innovation is also very high. Many people trying to create the next Facebook, the next Twitter, right? And then dem the demand, you, right, is very high. They say the number of users in Facebook is probably the largest country in the world right now, if it were its own nation, right? Because people get to do all kinds of things that they couldn't do before Facebook. However, politics 
I think both the supply and the demand is much, much lower. You look at the number of politicians who are very seriously interested in innovations that will improve the quality of democratic governance, it's a lot lower. And then you look at the, number of, uh, the ratio of citizens and their demands to use technology to improve their political interactions, and I think that's much lower too. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But this is the general claim. Now I'm going to zoom in, especially on this politics, and tell you why it's different from these other domains. First, demand. Think of demand as yourself and your own demand for technological usage, right? Now, the first way in which the demand side in politics is different from the demand side in commerce social and social interaction is that in commerce and social interaction you like technologies because they allow you to get individual benefits and gratifications very quickly, right? You can start watching that movie immediately. You don't have to go all the way to the, the store. Why do you like Facebook? Because you can find out what your friends are doing immediately. You can make snide comments about them immediately. You don't have to call them up on the phone or wait till you see them on vacation. You can do that right away. It's gratifying at the individual level. Politics is fundamentally different. Politics is fundamentally aggregated. It's fundamentally collective. Quite apart from the technology, whatever, if you seek to influence a political decision, there is no technology that can make that immediately gratifying for you. You have to combine with other people in some way, shape, or form to make that happen. And that is a fundamental disanalogy that makes uh, demand side innova uh, innovations that appeal to the demand side much more difficult in the political realm than in these other realms. Another demand feature. Now, uh, I'm going to have to explain a little bit here. One of the revolutionary features of internet and communication technologies is that they enable what Yohai Benkler and other people have called collaborative production. And so collaborative production is Wikipedia that I mentioned, it's Linux, it's these other, uh, and it's, uh, there are many versions of collaborative production. So one version is even, uh, so how many people have bought a book off Amazon? And so there are uh, a rating system, right? Many, many sellers have this feature where you buy a book, you read it, you can assign it one star if you didn't like it very much or five stars if you liked it a lot, right? Um, and then if enough people do that, you think you get some information about the average, you know, three and a half star, four star book. You get some information about that. That is a collaboratively produced review of the book, right? So that's another kind of collaborative production. This time, uh, the production of a view about a book. And so one thing that ICTs do is enable that kind of massively parallel collaborative production. And that how you see that a lot in the commercial realm and in the social realm. Now, many people have tried to apply this insight to the political realm as well. So I don't, probably uh, you may have followed this or not, but uh, when President Obama got elected, he created a website on, on whitehouse.gov called Open for Questions. And many, many people were supposed to ask questions on that website, and then the most popular questions they thought just like in Amazon, if you get a large enough number of people, you pick the top 10 questions, those will be the questions that Americans care most about, right? And so that's a good way to figure out the kinds of the, what the questions are that the president should answer, right? So what do you suppose some of the top questions were? Was President Obama born in the United States of America? Does he have a birth certificate, right? Why doesn't the president legalize marijuana? Right? And this is at a moment at which there are two wars going on and a major economic crisis. And so why didn't it work? Collaborative production works quite well in these other domains for Amazon ratings, for Wikipedia, and so on. It usually doesn't work in the political domain. And it doesn't work in the political domain because the political domain is oftentimes strategic. People want uh, things that are opposed to one another. So in Wikipedia, right, the knowledge is very, very good oftentimes in Wikipedia because of two features. So you think about an article on, um, 
I don't know, uh, an article on the downtown a Amsterdam or something like that, or the Amsterdam Central train station. You could probably, I haven't done it, but you could probably look it up on Wikipedia and you'd have a nice description of Amsterdam Central train station, right? And why is that? It's a couple, for a couple of reasons. It's because the people contributing to that article have a common interest in knowledge, in accurate knowledge about what the central train station in Amsterdam looks like. That's the first reason, common interest. The second reason is that they have a common metric, right? They can tell, they can judge what counts as a good contribution from a less good contribution, and so they'll continuously improve the article. But those two features are not true of open for questions on the White House because people have political agendas. They do not agree on what the truth is. They do not agree on what a better or worse answer is, right? They're fighting with one another. It's the nature of much political interaction that it's strategic. And that's why these collaborative production platforms have a much more difficult time flourishing in the political arena compared to uh, the productive arena, right? So those are two supply side differences. One, individual benefits. You don't really get those in politics. Two, the collaborative production dynamic that has made many killer applications very successful, that dynamic is not available in many parts of the political domain. So is that clear enough so far? So those are two demand side dynamics. Now I want to present two supply side dynamics. And what I mean by supply side are the people who are creating the technologies and funding the technologies and supporting the technologies, okay? I'll return to Amazon because it's an example everybody knows about. Amazon, what does it want? Uh, it wants to sell customers books. Why does it work? Because customers want those books, right? What's the political analogy? Citizens want to influence political decisions. The second statement, the analogy to Amazon, is that politicians and officials want to give citizens power to influence those decisions. Do you think that second thing is true? No, of course not. So that's a fundamental reason why the supply side of ICTs and politics is different from the demand side or uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, from the supply side in uh, commercial interactions and productive interactions. That's one reason. A second supply side difference is that the benefits to success are much more ambiguous. Okay? So, uh, for any of the entrepreneurs that I showed on the first slide, for uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the person who created Facebook, Jeff Bezos, one of the people in Amazon, for Google, right? For the people who create those technologies, more users and more transactions means what? More money, more fame, more wealth, more power, right? It's only good if they succeed. What happens if a politician, a member of parliament or your prime minister, creates a site that really enables more public deliberation and more political accountability? Is that good or bad for him or her? I think some parts are good, right? They would have created this thing that is politically significant and important, but it's also potentially bad. What if on that site, I mean, it happened, I told you, with Open for Questions. That was a successful site, lots of people participated, but the results were quite embarrassing, right? So there's, always, there's also a potential downside. So this isn't to say that successful political ICT innovations are always bad for politicians. They're not always bad for politicians. Sometimes they're good. But the benefits are much more ambiguous than they are in the commercial and productive sectors. Right? So do you see what I'm saying? The incentive for the politician to actually support an ICT innovation is much, much lower than it is for an investor or an entrepreneur in the commercial and social sectors, right? So um, if you look at, uh, I, d I wonder if it's the same for your members of parliament. You know, all of our people, uh, all of our congressional representatives have websites, of course, right? And they have, you know, they put you, uh, they tell you a little bit about themselves and their, uh, uh, what their voting record is and what their positions are on those websites. But it's very hard to communicate with the member of Congress 
on that website. There's not even, usually not even an email address, right? Some, usually there's a button you can press to fill out some form to give them a complaint. It would be a very simple matter, an elementary matter, to implement a technology that created some discussion on that website among the person, among the uh, politicians' constituents. You know, they could talk to one another, they could raise issues, why aren't you working on this, that, or the other thing. Those websites almost never have those features, even though they would be very simple to implement, right? And why is that? It's because the benefits of that dis deliberative technology on the politician's website would present a lot of political risk. That's why you don't see them, right? It's not that the innovation is there, it is there. You know, Probably half the people in this room could write that little piece of code and, and, uh, for the politician today, but, but they don't want it. That's the reason, not because the technology isn't there, right? So, in sum, the supply side of ICTs in politics is more constrained. There's a smaller flow of ICT platform innovations in the political sphere than there is in the commercial sphere or productive sphere or social sphere. And then on the demand side, um, the dynamics that explain the rise of these killer applications in the commercial and productive and social spheres are much uh, smaller than uh, the, the demand side factors that explain adoption in the political sphere. Um, now, this is not to say that we won't ever see a killer innovation in the political sphere. We may well see one. But if we do see one, its dynamics are going to be much different from the dynamics that explain these dramatic successes in these other spheres of our lives. Right Now, they say it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So now I will move to a second part of remarks, which are more empirical, which focus on some organizations around the world, mostly in developing countries, that have used technology to good effect in, uh, to enhance political deliberation and political accountability. And uh, the purpose of this part of the remarks is to highlight for you some of the ways in which technology can enhance political accountability and political participation, right? So these are more incremental gains that operate on different dynamics from the killer application picture. And so last summer, uh, I was part of a team that uh, went all over the world to look at different uh, civil society organizations that employed technology to enhance their uh, political public accountability and uh, civic engagement efforts. So some of these, uh, I'll go through some of these in more detail in a moment, but uh, Cidade de Democratica in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Reclamos in Chile, the budget tracking tool in Kenya. The most famous of these is uh, Ushahidi, which comes from Kenya. Has anybody heard about Ushahidi before? So just a few people. I'll explain what it is in a moment. Mumbai Votes in India, Kirti in Bangalore, India, and the Fair Play Alliance in Slovakia. Okay. Now, so what, what I want to do is present for you, first, a model of politics, a very simple uh, primary school model of politics. And I want to use this to consider some different ways in which technology might help politics or not, right? So that's the use of this schema. So it's a very simple schema, right? Citizens have things that they want and they operate through traditional organizations like political parties or interest groups, pressure groups of different kinds that, uh, that then influence politicians. That's one way. Another way is that they engage with one another in the public sphere, in the uh, media, in the press, that then may put some pressure on politicians to do this or that thing. And then finally, the politicians um, may respond to that communicative pressure or that electoral pressure or the lobbying pressure to change their laws and policies or to act publicly, right? Now, so the question, if you're thinking about technology and politics is, what difference, if any, does technology make for this picture? So if we were to draw a picture, you know, a box with technology, with ICT in it, where would you put it in this picture, right? That's what the purpose of the picture is. Now, one person who's uh, uh, very enthusiastic about technology and politics is Clay Shirky and has a wonderful book called Here Comes Everyone. 
And he says, newly capable groups are assembling and they're working within the manage, with the managerial imperative uh, and outside previous structures. And he says that information technologies allow all these groups to spontaneously form and do things. And that's the difference that technology is going to make. It's going to allow people to do things in politics that is unmediated from the traditional uh, blocks of interest groups of the public sphere. That is, what technology will do is enable citizens to immediately combine to do what they want and they'll just act, right? So that's one thesis about how technology changes politics. That's not what, we didn't see that in any of our cases. It just didn't happen that way, right? That's, so that's one picture. Another picture is that what technology does is it makes the public sphere much more capable and much more democratic because anybody can participate, because it's leveling, because these big commercial, uh, dom uh, commercial mass media organizations won't control things anymore when everyone can engage in the internet. And so another hypothesis is that internet technologies make the public sphere big and so communicative action will be the way in which uh, ICT democratizes politics. We also did not see that, right? A third possibility, and maybe Martin can make this happen in the uh, environmental and scientific domain, is that ICTs may allow citizens to communicate directly with government, right? That if government agencies use ICTs to directly convene citizens, it may bypass both the public sphere and traditional organizations and create a kind of direct, uh, a more direct pathway between citizens and government. Now, in the cases that we looked at, we also did not see that, right? Although I, I think it's possible, we just didn't see it. The cases that we looked at, by the way, were what we thought, uh, based on a scan conducted by uh, this organization, Global Voices, as the most sophisticated and successful uses of information and, techno and communication technologies in the developing world, right? So. Let me pause for a moment. I'm not totally skeptical about technologies and politics, but I do think that it does require a lot of will from the politician that is often lacking, certainly in the United States and maybe in, uh, and maybe in Europe as well. There is one killer example of technology and politics that I've run across, and it comes from Belo Horizonte in Brazil. So how many people have heard of participatory budgeting? Participatory, so a few. So all over Brazil and all over Latin America, there are hundreds and hundreds of cities in which government dedicates a significant amount of money at the municipal level, between 10 million, sometimes uh, uh, 50 million dollars, sometimes more, uh, to citizens and allow citizens to decide directly what to do with that money in terms of infrastructure investment or whatever projects they would like. In Belo Horizonte, they created a, uh, participatory budgeting, but they created an electronic platform to allow people to engage, to decide how to allocate, uh, I think it was probably $12 million equivalent in one year, and they've done it several years uh, after that, okay? So they created, they said, okay, well, $10 million, we're just going to let whoever comes to this website decide among this list of infrastructure projects, and the top projects will get the investment, right? 10% of the electorate participated in that participatory budgeting platform. Uh, to me, 10% is a lot. I don't know of any other electronic platform in which 10% of the eligible people participated. So to me, that is a um, successful effort, okay? But what drives that effort is not the invention of a new technology, but a politician or a set of political actors in this case who's committed to using existing technology for more democratic ends, or ends that I would consider uh, more deeply democratic anyway. Okay, so let's return to the political models. This is Clay Shirky's idea. I think it's not true, at least in the cases we looked at, because, right, so this, this thesis is that what ICTs do is make organizations much, much less important. People don't need organizations anymore because technology allows them to combine and do things. It, technology can take the place of these large organizational structures. However, I think that's not the case. 
organizations remain the linchpin of politics even when uh, good information and communication technologies are available. So here are three ways that uh, we've found technology does enhance political engagement and political accountability based on these case studies that we did, again, mostly from the Global South. The first is, uh, well, you can, uh, I'm calling it truth-based advocacy. And so the idea here is that traditional organizations can use information and communication technologies to surface a particular truth that is surprising and politically significant that changes what people think and thereby changes what government does, right? So, uh, so we didn't look at this case, but some people might consider the case of WikiLeaks a case of truth-based advocacy, right? So there you have a, a ICT platform that gathers a bunch of information that puts it out, and many people consider the information that is contained on WikiLeaks to be true, right? Very credible because it's, you know, verbatim cables and other sources of information uh, that were leaked, at least some of the content of WikiLeaks. And then that information and communication technology, those truths that weren't known before or people didn't agree were true before becomes politically salient and creates pressure on politicians and government to change what it does. So we saw several examples of that dynamic going on. ICTs enhancing a kind of truth-based advocacy. Uh, one example comes from uh, Mumbai Votes, which is an organization in India that gathers a lot of information about political candidates. Um, you know, in India, as in many other developing countries, the political reporting is not as good as it is here, right? Oftentimes citizens lack good information about candidates. So Mumbai Votes uh, is an organization that gathered a lot of this information and made it available uh, through online technology. So you get the backgrounds of candidates and their, uh, if they're elected, you get their voting records and so on and whether or not they delivered on their promises, things of that nature. And so Mumbai votes, uh, there are several cases in which Mumbai votes gathered information about political candidates in which it came out that they had been criminally prosecuted or other kinds of scandals. And that became very important in the electoral process, right? So that is an example of truth-based advocacy. The ICT enabled the collection of this information that many people considered credible and true and politically important and surprising. And that information altered public opinion, and that altered the outcome of who got elected in the case of Mumbai votes, right? That's an, the one example. Another example of truth-based advocacy is the Kenyan budget tracking tool, which gathers a whole lot of information about uh, budget allocations and uh, spending on local community development projects, and it's information, spending information that's uh, requested by NGOs and what the budget tracking tool does is allow those NGOs to identify discrepancies and where money is being lost in through uh, leakage, corruption, other kinds of sources. And so the Ken Kenyan budget tracking tool is very credible. It's perceived as a neutral source. It creates a truth about where the corruption is, where the leakage is, how much the leakage is that people didn't know before. NGOs use that, that truth to enhance their advocacy activities, thereby change what government does, right? The facts, what become facts through the use of these information and communication technologies create uh, a pressure on local officials to clean up, right? Um, so that's one way. I'm going to present three modes in which ICTs can enhance politics. The first one is truth-based advocacy. Now I want to talk about a second one, political mobilization. ICTs can create, can lower the costs of political mobilization and allow traditional organizations to seek out citizens who support their causes and mobilize them. And that enhances the strength of those traditional organizations and enhances their capability to lobby government to change what it does. Uh, one good example of this came, comes from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and some uh, towns surrounding Sao Paulo. It's called Cidade Democ De Democratica. 
Uh, and it's, uh, what Sadaje does is it's a, what Sadaje is, is an online platform that allows all kinds of uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, to nominate projects and urban problems and then citizens participate and they decide to join some of these efforts. It's kind of a political marketplace for urban problem solving. And there have been uh, several pretty impressive examples in which Sadaje has allowed NGOs to strengthen their support for different causes and thereby changed uh, urban planning and urban policy in these towns around Sao Paulo, Brazil, right? And so there, what the ICT is doing is lowering the costs of citizens to find out what the problems are and what they want to invest their political energies in. It creates a kind of social monitoring. Okay. So moving right along. The third uh, political dynamic that ICTs can set into motion is social monitoring, right? Um, the most famous example of this is Ushahidi. So I'm just going to explain what it is by explaining an example. Uh, in 2008, uh, a NGO, a non-governmental organization called Ushahidi, created a platform in which uh, anyone could report election violence incidents in Kenya. Okay, so there's an election in Kenya, there's a lot of violence, it's hard to find out where exactly that violence is occurring because there's too few journalists, too few election monitors, too few government authorities. Okay, so what they do is they create a platform on the web and if Martin or David sees an incident of election violence, they will uh, on their mobile dial in or file a rep web report and then a pin pops up and say, you know, in this town in Kenya somebody got beaten up or, or whatever it is and then if enough people do that, it's a social monitoring uh, mechanism through which ICTs enable uh, the gathering of much, much more information about social reality than would otherwise have been available. Before uh, the lecture, we were talking about uh, uh, some scientific uses of uh, crowdsource monitoring of this kind. There's a report, uh, I think it's an international report that comes out every few years called The State of the Birds. And this is meant to be the authoritative guide to uh, trends in bird populations and bird migration and bird monitoring, right? But it's a very difficult report to assemble because, why? There are many more birds than there are bird scientists. That's a fundamental problem. And so what they do is they've created, uh, this has existed for a very long time before ICTs, but ICTs make this uh, easier. They allow bird watchers, bird, uh, amateur bird watchers from all over the world to file reports about when they see a bird, where it's going, how many of them there are, and they compile all of this information, go through some quality control, and through all of this crowdsource, through this crowdsource mechanism, they can get a much, much better picture of bird trends, bird population, migration patterns than they could without, uh, if it were only bird scientists trying to conduct this monitoring by themselves through professional means. So that's another example of crowdsource social monitoring. Um, and so how that ICT can also change governance and, in this case, public administration by enlisting citizens to provide reports about the social reality that will enable government to be more effective at what it does, whether it's preventing, ele preventing election violence or, uh, or monitoring bird populations. Now, that's a couple of examples. A good, another good example is... Uh, a site in the United Kingdom uh, that was developed by Fix, uh, that was developed by this organization, My My Society, that's called FixMyStreet.com. And you may have some versions here in cities in uh, in the Netherlands that allow uh, any citizen to file a web complaint about you know a, a street light is not working or there's a pothole here or some other graffiti or something, and they can file it on the web and then it. Uh, a map like Ushahidi is displayed at which all the reports are there and allows uh, both officials and citizens to have a much better picture of where the urban problems are, right? That's another example of crowdsourced social monitoring. So that's the third mechanism, okay? 
So those are uh, three, so what I presented in the second part of the talk is several ways in which technology will not revolutionize politics, right? It won't take organizations out of the picture. It won't uh, transform politics by fundamentally making the public sphere much more powerful than it was before, right? It won't do those things, but it does have, uh, we did see many ways in which technology incrementally amplified the ability of organizations to uh, engage citizens and enhance political accountability. And one of them is truth-based advocacy, the second is political mobilization, and the third is, crowd, uh, is social monitoring. Okay? Okay, now, so I'm coming to the end of my uh, present rem remarks here. So several take-home messages. One, contrary to the title of Clay Shirky's book, not everybody's coming. But professionals and organizations are, and that's important. So one image of what information and communication technologies will do is that they will engage millions and millions of citizens in political action and take organizations out of the picture. Uh, but anyway, from the cases that we looked at, that's usually not what happens. Usually it's professional organizations and professionals that utilize ICTs for political ends, and sometimes they can use them to engage lots of citizens. Um, when I talk to uh, public officials in the U.S. who are trying to utilize technologies, this comes as some surprise oftentimes to them, right? So um, I don't know if, if you guys have looked at the websites that the U.S. government set up, usaspending.gov or data.gov or recovery.gov. These are sites that create a lot of data that make government much more open by putting a bunch of data out there. So just as an example, recovery.gov is probably the most comprehensive public budget transparency effort in the history of the world because it makes uh, uh, all of the dollars that are going into the stimulus spending package, the federal stimulus pack, spending package, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, available for anyone to look at down to a high level of detail, right? And so they spent a lot of money creating this website and the thought was that this would increase political accountability, right? But what's the theory behind that? The theory is that, you know, after a hard day at work, I'm going to download this large data set and install a statistical analysis application on my laptop and figure out what the spending... No, that's not going to happen, right? Ordinary citizens, for the most part, I think, Recovery.gov is not very useful. It is useful to professionals like journalists who are reporting on the recovery, to advocacy organizations and to others, but the original theory that the main user would be an ordinary citizen, I think, is just not very well thought through. And government officials are upset that more ordinary people aren't using these kinds of facilities, but I don't think they should be upset because there's no reason for... Uh, Ordinary people, I think, have uh, most people have low incentives to use these kinds of data. So, ha have people, how many people have seen this movie, The Social Network, about Facebook? Have you, anybody seen that? Oh, so a few people. There's this scene in the movie in which Mark Zuckerberg, he's an undergraduate at Harvard University, he's, he's a little, you know, has drank a little bit too much, it's after a party, and he's thinking about how to design the front page of Facebook. I presume most people have seen the front page of Facebook. Facebook, right, their, their user page. And he's thinking, he's thinking, what should I put in it? And he has this epiphany, and he says, we've got to put a relationship status field in Facebook, right? Your relationship status field is whether you're single, you're married, you have a boyfriend, you have a girlfriend. And this is very, very important, fundamental to the success of Facebook, because one of the uses of Facebook is to see whether somebody I met at a party is married or single or whatever, so that I might want to message them later, you know, just to have a nice conversation. Um, and that was fundamental to the success of Facebook. But the key is, he had the thought in his mind, what value are people really getting out of this technology that I'm trying to create, right? What value is the user getting? And whenever, often, oftentimes, when I talk to public sector people thinking about the technologies that they're, they're creating, they do not ask that fundamental question. That is the first question they should ask. Usually the question that they ask is, what data do I have in my file drawer and how can I put that on the internet? That is the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, who's going to care and what will they do with it and what consequence will it have? Right? It's a very easy point 
And for many, many kinds of political information, political platforms, individual motives for engaging are quite low. That's the point there. Second point, information and communication, or second take-home message, second conclusion. Information and communication technologies do not mis displace mainstream media, but rather information and communication technologies and mainstream media operate in a symbiotic context. So just, again, think about WikiLeaks, right? WikiLeaks did not succeed because Julian Assange and his colleagues created a website and put it up there. It probably would have had some impact, but it was much more successful because he created a strategic interaction with The Guardian, with El País, four or five other very respectable mainstream media organizations to get to both validate that information and disseminate it. So think about ICTs and mainstream media as operating in a symbiotic relationship, not as one displacing the other. Third take home message, information and te communication technologies don't really go around or undermine traditional NGOs and government. They operate through those traditional NGOs and government, right? So where information and communication technologies have a large impact, what they do is they amplify the strategies that government agencies or non-governmental organizations are already trying to implement. Fourth message, Getting the context right is more important than getting the right technology. And what do I mean by this? From the, if you're thinking from the perspective of a technologist, your view oftentimes is, if I just create the right technology, then good political and social effects will occur. However, that's usually not the case. What is more often the case is that technology is the last piece of a jigsaw puzzle in a much larger political and social context, right? And so there have been studies in Africa about the use of mobile phones and how they really increase the welfare of farmers because they, uh, the mobiles enable farmers to get their products to the right markets in the right places and they enable them to know what the, a fair price is, right? And all that is true. I believe it. I believe it to, to be true. Mobile phones do are, are good for, you know, make the markets more efficient that way. But think about what else has to be in place for the mobile phone to have that effect. There has to not be a war going on. There have to be roads that are uh, relatively passable to those markets. Um, there have to be all kinds of other infrastructure. So it's not just the mobile, right? The technologist oftentimes focuses on the mobile or similar technology, but you have to understand how the technology meshes with that larger context, right? The final message is that Max Weber famous, famously said in Politics as a Vocation, that politics is the strong and slow boring of hard boards, right? That politics is very difficult work. ICTs don't fundamentally change that fact. They don't give you, tra tra you know, take a hand tool and transform it into some magical Dr. Seuss machine. No, politics don't do, or information and communication technologies don't do that. However, what they can do is accelerate the process press of politics. They can turn a hand drill into a power drill, but, you, but it's nevertheless the case that you still need to know where to drill the hole and how many holes to drill. A carpenter is going to drill a straighter, more aligned hole than me. You need a cabinet maker to make a table, a bookshelf, or a cabinet with the boards, um, and so on. And this dynamic is very unlike, for example, the Wikipedia dynamic in which uh, expertise and skill are uh, less at a premium than in the political domain. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Arkon, for, for, for your lecture. And we agreed that I would uh, say a few words and then open up uh, for discussion. And as I introduced you, I already said something about what we are currently sort of seeing as our agenda here uh, in, in the Dutch government, but also in particular the, what we're doing at the uh, planning agency. And at some point, I'm, I'm sure some of the audience might have thought, where is that connection again? So uh, let me try and, 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 and figure that out uh, by uh, giving my uh, impression, sharing that with you, and then perhaps there are a few sort of points for the discussion that we can then uh, open up. 
Um, now, first of all, I, I thought what you did was really interesting, and you gave us time to reflect on what you see as, as politics. And um, I have two, two, two points about that. So the, the first one is, of course, if there was, there is no, in the first uh, instance, is if there was no killer ICT practice in, in politics. I was thinking why you, why you didn't refer to the Obama campaign as, as a case where uh, ICT was used to first, for the first time, get, get a grassroots financial system in place that, at least according to the reports, rivaled the more traditional, say, corporate financial system. And that most certainly, if that's the case, seemed to be an instance of a, a killer uh, application. But I'm sure you have had that question before and you have an answer. Um, the, the second point that relates to that, though, is that there's always in political science a question of what, what, how you define politics. And um, in, in Amsterdam, where, of course, uh, I am half a day a week, uh, at least in theory, to, uh, to, to work on, on, on politics, we have a broad definition of politics. And so you would be taught, at least, uh, I hope they still are, um, in, a, in a broad definition of politics that includes social movements as a crucial element of, of, of the political. Now, in, your, in the second part of your talk, you broadened up considerably in what politics was. But, I mean, Facebook, Tahir Square, right? That is a political ICT nexus. Yes, it's the, it's, so it's the, the traditional central square of a city that is meaningless in a dictatorship but becomes again meaningful if there is this Egyptian student that uses Facebook to gather people in their, in their unfavorable political circumstances. And so that, that suggests that if you have a broader understanding of politics then there may actually be cases where you would say that um, that the ICT politics nexus is much more much more direct. Now, what I thought that that for the purposes of of what we are sort of struggling with was most interesting in 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 your talk is what you said about these experiments that you sort of looked into uh, all over the world, and there there are actually many more similarities. Um, um, to what we have uh, experienced. Now, think of the following. We make models about noise pollution levels. They are crucial for legal cases. People can win a legal case or lose it because of a model that scientists make. But now, what's the situation? You have a very cheap tool that allows you to connect your PC to a noise pollution meter and the internet allows you to create real time noise pollution level maps. And so you can go to, uh, to, to the internet and see the noise pollution levels that we have above the Hague. And you can actually follow the planes and of course if you have a very simple application you can also determine what plane it must have been that crossed into the corridor to, to the airport. Eh? So that makes the sort of the, the uh, privilege you have with your model, which is a model, right? It is, it, it is not based on constant empirical input. The privilege is gone, and there is actually for citizens a new possibility to say, well, actually, we measured it ourselves, and these data are, are re sort of reorganizing the, the, uh, the situation. I suppose you would call that... Uh, a case of uh, truth-based efficacy. Yeah? So that's, that's definitely something that we see uh, currently, uh, currently happening. Um, another thing, I suppose, that is very close to our reality is the fact that, indeed, uh, if it's not the citizen, then it is, indeed, organizations that prosper a lot and have their... So, therefore, in the balancing of, of power, ICT definitely does a lot for previously peripheral organizations to become much more, more powerful. Um, we uh, ourselves had a, an instance where we used the, the internet, and it's actually a, an ironic example. Um, we were, had the privilege of uh, studying the IPCC fourth assessment report a year ago after some mistakes were uh, discovered. Uh, you remember the Himalayan glaciers, and then, of course, the uh, percentage of the Netherlands that was below sea level. And that caused a lot of unrest. 
And um, the press at that moment were of the conviction that this was just the tip of the iceberg. So there, there was, a, 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 again, a, a partly internet-based climate gate community that suggested that climate gate was the frame and this was going to lead to the complete uh, exposure of a plot of scientists and, uh, and uh, issue advocates. Now, what we did in the course of that investigation that we had to do was first of all be very aware that we were in the dock for many of them as because they thought we were ourselves alarmists rather than being an objective arbiter. And one of the ways we try and cancel it out is allow the audience, the public, into the investigation. So many of the people in the PBL are uh, scared when on public television I announced that we were going to uh, launch a website where the people could uh, contribute to our investigation by you know, pointing at mistakes that they had found uh, in the I IPCC report. Um, now, we uh, translated that into a, uh, a server-based website, and uh, let me say it was slightly overdimensionized. Uh, we uh, had thought it was going to be uh, uh, was to, going to cripple the RVM uh, servers, but as it happened, only 44 people uh, sent in um, alleged uh, mistakes. So. But nevertheless, we, if it would have been 4,000, we, uh, we could have easily uh, handled, uh, handled them. <laughs> the point, however, was, was not that, there, that uh, there were only few of these entries. The point was, of course, that you allowed the public in and that you t were at pains to be accountable to what people thought was a mistake and be completely transparent. So I suppose in that sense, you may again reflect how a government in this day and age which is low on legitimacy where there is a high level of mistrust let's just accept that how these tools can be used to enhance trust and also uh, uh, make what governments do more accountable and then I suppose the examples you gave are potentially perhaps not revolutionary, but that would have been, a, that was a rather big claim that you uh, first wanted to make, but actually very important to strengthen what is the sort of the democratic moment uh, in our society. And I suppose again then, it is indeed uh, occurred to me, thanks to your very useful uh, schemes, that it is all about public sphere, right? It is, it's, it's far less about the old aggregate political system. It is about what do we think is the situation in society, what are the problems, and what do we know about them? And there, I suppose, we can see, uh, we can do much more, much more uh, with these tools. And I suppose we are of the conviction that we should. There is, there is no way into saying, well, actually, we're not Amazon.com, it won't work. No, it seems to be that we have to explore these possibilities that uh, ICT gives to us because not doing that will be seen as a political statement in itself. And I suppose my interest would be to see if we, as a, as a community of uh, policymakers, citizens and, and academics, can take that further as we are actually on, at the moment at a point that we uh, hear people from the current cabinet say that they want to go into that route, so it would be really useful to reflect on it and have the privilege of uh, having you present uh, among us. Yeah. Upon that, who could I, who could I ask to uh, come in to the conversation uh, on uh, this important uh, topic? <laughs> No, well, I mean, has, does anybody have a question for Arkel? <laughs> the more traditional variation. I think I will. Is one microphone? Yes. Actually, like you, you, you can. Yeah, this is so perfect. Let's see. Um, I'm Andre Peter Sweem. I work for the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs. Um, What's interesting for me is, the, you already mentioned the 
Maar de mensen in de uh, Tagierplein in Egypt, de Facebook Revolution. How would you analyze that? How does that fit into your schedules? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that uh, the way to think about technology in the Arab Spring revolutions, especially, thank you very much, especially Egypt, is that the ICT technologies will be used as other information and communication technologies have always been used in by both sides in that kind of struggle, right? So a friend of mine, the, the person who has the office next to mine is a, a very good uh, political scientist who studies Egypt, and in particular his first book is about the Muslim Brotherhood, and so he's been following these events very closely, and he's talking to him about this and what he thought about the Facebook claims, and he said, look, you know, yes, they used Facebook, and yes, they used ICTs, and it made things easier, just like having a pair of shoes makes it easier to go to a demonstration than not having a pair of shoes, right? Having uh, access to a telephone makes the uh, organization more easy than not having access to a telephone, right? And the regime obviously saw this, which is why they took steps to really constrain uh, access to ICTs uh, during that period. Um, so that's the first thing. Is I, I think I would ha have to hear more to know why this technology is quantitatively qualitatively different from other technologies like that, right? It's why the government always takes a radio station in a conflict is because they know that technology is very important, right? Now, one way in which uh, Facebook and other electronic communication technologies may be particularly important in authoritarian regimes is that they create a substitution effect. They create another opportunity. So in Egypt, during the Mubarak regime, it was illegal for more than six or seven people to gather in a place to have a conversation, right? So the law blocks off a traditional way to communicate, which is like us sitting in this room. We can't do that, right, without government permission. Um, Facebook creates a functional substitute, at least, for that kind of communication, right? And so it's particularly important when laws and other structures prevent uh, forms of communication. ICTs enable the information to travel in these other ways. I think that that is important. So I think there probably is a kind of substitution effect. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Kvide Rijfkamp. I'm working at the uh, Wageningen University in a small research unit about critical technology construction. Um, I would like to pose some questions about the uh, following issues because um, I was a little bit upset, to be honest, uh, although I uh, liked very much your presentation, but I was a little bit upset about the use of the core concepts, technology and politics and also the separated uh, connection in a certain sense between on one hand technologies and on the other hand politics. Uh, already there has been made some kind of uh, remarks about okay, next to politics located in policy institutions, you have the whole debate about sub-politics. Sub-politics as uh, Uri Berg uh, has uh, described. Secondly on technology, there is also a whole debate about the politics in technology. And that has been not mentioned, if I understood correctly from your presentation. And there has been a whole debate also by Paul Virilio about the speed of information and the consequences of that, and about uh, Stiegler's remarks about uh, the attention demanding goods of informatics and the politics in that. Uh, which may also a little bit broaden up uh, your presentation is that still talks about technology and politics while the actual reality is that politics are dominantly present in the technology. Can you tell something about that? Yeah, I take those points. I think that technology uh, or politics are very much embedded in every single technology that we see is the product of some uh, political dynamic and sometimes political struggle. And that's definitely true, right? Um, this presentation did not engage that set of questions at all. I think it's a, 
uh, it's a related but separate set of questions from the liberating potential of technology, right? So the technologies, so most of those conversations or many of those conversations posit uh, a world in which at least, uh, well, one version is that the internet is much more closed up than it is now. So in the United States, we have this danger of very large telecommunications companies fundamentally altering the way in which information or shaping the way in which information te and communication technologies are deployed and thereby changing the nature of technology itself to limit the liberating possibilities of technology through structural decisions, right, in the political realm. Um, I think that's true. However, I don't think I need to engage that set of questions to think about the liberating or non-liberating potential of technologies in the cases and in the dynamics that I discussed, right? So can you think, I guess a, a argumentative way to put it would be, can you think of uh, politics that you like resulting in a better technology that would be more liberating and avoid the arguments that I presented? against the revolutionary potential of technology in politics, right? And I think that, that it would be uh, a little bit hard to do because uh, I think at the level that I looked at it, at the level of these platforms and so on, um, the platform creation, while yes, it is shaped by politics in all of these ways, it's a pretty open field. Um, and so this was an empirical, in part, an empirical exercise uh, that zooms down and looks at particular cases of how technology and politics interact at the, at the very ground level. And, and one of the things, as I said at the outset, that I really wanted to do was avoid the uh, more high altitude discussion of technology as a social force by allowing greater speed or many to many communication. I guess I think that there's been a lot of work at that level and the insight that it provides about how to actually make progress is limited. Yeah, thanks, Helene de Koning. I work with the Energy Research Center of the Netherlands. I have a question for you, Archon, and one for Martin. Um, the first question to you. Uh, you said that disruptive technologies may come in when uh, one of the conditions is that the technology is perceived as a big improvement compared to the old uh, technology. Yeah, what some of my colleagues are finding, we do research on, on social adoption of energy technologies, among other things, is also that there has to be some type of dissatisfaction with the old technology combined with a great improvement that the new technology provides. So if you take that into account and you look at, for instance, American democracy, where there is voting power, and actually most people think they're the greatest democracy in the world, do you think maybe the, <laughs> well, that's what they say. <laughs> do you think maybe that uh, the dissatisfaction may just not be big enough for new technologies to come into uh, politics as well, just as an, as an idea? The question for Martin is, uh, in the scheme that Archon provided, does the PBL see itself as a public agency or as a traditional organization? <laughs> well, you're first. I'll leave Martin some, some time to think. <laughs> yeah, give me some time to think about it. Um, it's a good question. I mean, my first response is to say that the two go together, is that when you're presented with some alternative that can accomplish an and that you want much better than you adopt it. But then, you know, my second thought is, I think maybe there is something to that, is that if, uh, if there's a higher level of dissatisfaction, then maybe the willingness to explore other ways, uh, other technologies and other ways of accomplishing that thing will be greater, right? Um, so it, it has puzzled me why the rate of uh, innovation in democratic politics generally, quite apart from technology, but also with technology in the United States is so low compared to other parts of the world, especially Brazil, where the rate of innovation in political institutions that aim to deepen democracy is very, very high. You see lots of new things all the time. Um, and, uh, at one, I don't know how to think about whether Americans are satisfied or dissatisfied with their democracy, right? So on one level, if you ask, you know, public opinion polls ask all the time, every year for many, many decades have asked, 
Um, do you think, by and large, the people in Washington are working to advance the interests of all or only a very few? And the rate of people answering only a very few is very, very high now. I think probably 60, 70 percent plus, right? So on that dimension, on the pub that measure of public opinion, people aren't very happy, right? If you ask them about Congress, not very happy. But then I think, I don't know whether there are public opinion questions that ask this, but my sense is if you ask people whether or not they'd want to change the institutions that they have, they would reject that, even as they're unhappy with the results of that. And so the two don't exactly meet. So I think there probably is something to your, uh, your remark about the lack of dissatisfaction, although it's not quite as simple as that. Yeah. Um, nice try. Um, but you won't hear me uh, saying that we are a traditional organization. It's actually, it's, it's actually not even necessary to uh, fall into that uh, trap because we, we are ob obviously a, a public agency and I suppose one of the things I'm trying to figure out is what is our new role in this new mediatized world. And um, I see uh, incredible leveling out of knowledge claims and uh, people more and more able to come up with quite professional claims about uh, reality, relationships between pollution and, and, and health issues and, and the like. And I see that as something that agencies like PBL or RVM have to respond to. If we don't, we, we, we run into trouble. But to give you a sense how difficult that is, I mean, just think of RIVM and its uh, trouble. They are the, the Health uh, Research Institute in the Netherlands. And they, at some point, sent out a letter to uh, the parents of all 12-year-old uh, women that they could get a vaccination against a particular form of cancer. And, and it was seen as an offer the public made to its citizens, right? The, the public organization made to its citizens. But over the Internet, this was turned into something that the state wanted to impose on citizens, and that clearly was going to make you more ill. Probably it was actually a, a way to inject people with, uh, with a chip so that they could always know where, where these 12-year-olds were going to be and, until they died. So there was a whole sort of debate going on that had not been anticipated at all by a public agency. The response, uh, the, the, the result was that the number of girls, the percentage of girls and parents that, that turned up was very low. So what they then did is reinvent themselves. They reinvented themselves in a communication technological sense by no longer presenting analytic knowledge, but having people like a, a pediatrician or a, a housewife or a teacher or s s to present evidence that actually, by and large, was actually a very good idea to go. And, so, and it was a very popular website. But before I, I, I gave a talk on that, I, I thought, well, I better double check the website of that NGO that was so critical about it, Kritisch uh, Brikke. And they had reinvented themselves on the website and had become completely professional. So now, so you had the official agency that looked really cool <laughs> and not scientific at all. And then you had the NGO that had turned to the professional organization. So there is a horizontalization going on that you can't ignore and you have to sort of think about. So you cannot be a traditional public agency. And, 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 and to relate it to, to a question to you, Arkham, so I'm really interested if y y your sort of project, uh, if you see also EPA, for instance, responding to that. And how, how are they using these tools? Because, I mean, as we are here, we're all trying to figure out what the challenge is for public agencies. Yeah, so on the, I wanted to reflect on the legitimacy and transparency <laughs> remarks. I thought that your discussion of the... Uh, putting an opportunity for people to comment on the climate investigation uh, report was very, very interesting. I mean, it, it's curious that the feedback was so low given how high profile the original event was, so that, that's curious. I have a couple of thoughts that go in different directions about that kind of exercise. And one thought is that transparency itself 
does generate some additional credibility even if nobody actually goes to the website. So there's all of these websites like Open, Open Secrets in the United States and even Mumbai Votes and, um, and Fair Play Alliance that I discussed very briefly in the presentation. And it seems that just the fact that all of that information is on the web makes it a more neutral and credible source. The, the fact that I know that I could check even if I never do check, makes me have some more confidence in it than I otherwise would. So that, that's to think, well, it was a good move to do that um, in terms of trust and legitimacy and credibility. Now the flip side of that is that I see the whole open government movement in the United States as having uh, potentially counterproductive consequences if you're uh, on the pro progressive side of the polit political spectrum, right? So the open government movement in the United States is all about making government more open to its citizens, putting all of this information on the web, everything else, everything else, right? And you have, they've done a lot of that activity. And I think it's counterproductive for the fo following reason. I think it may actually reinforce the delegitimization of government in the following way. So if you put all of this spending information about the stimulus package on the web, journalists will use that information. And what will they use it for? They'll use it to try to find government making a mistake. Because the ethos right now, media ethos in the United States, as I imagine it is here, they see their job as the watchdog, right? Cat finding government doing something wrong. So that's going to be their particular use of the information. And you marry that to a public that you say is cynical in the United States or in the Netherlands. I just told you is pretty skeptical about government in the United States, and it, so it feeds a cycle of delegitimation, right? And so, to me, I think that open government right now it's framed as transparency for accountability, right? That's what the movement, that's what people in government make us accountable. That's what the president you know, how he pitches it, it can be counterproductive because it engages in a spiral of delegitimation given what the how the transparency is framed and what people are using it for, okay? So I say it's, it, it's kind of like an Amazon rating system, a five-star rating system, in which it's only possible for government to get one or two stars because the people using the information and the information itself is not designed to evaluate whether government is doing a one-star job or a five-star job, so. I, and I suppose I see that a, a public agency like PBL should pre precisely provide that, you see? <laughs> it's not the data, it's the, poli uh, the, the policy analysis of things. Why, how can we explain why it's so difficult to reach particular goals, right? Yeah. And what can they do about it, yeah, yeah. Many questions, yeah. Hello, my name is Anouk van Lammer and I'm working at the Human Resource Department of the PDL, PBL. I was wondering, uh, during your research, um, aren't we in need of some sort of new level leadership? So uh, isn't it uh, making um, a leader more strong whether they can uh, say, well, all these uh, information about me, about my policy is there available to the public, but I'm a new level leader and uh, I did things wrong, but uh, I can, uh, may, I'm accountable for it, so now I'm a stronger leader. So uh, it's not a danger, but it's a strength in a way to use this information. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think that that's true. I think that that is a, a minimum requirement of leadership in this new age where everything is much, much more transparent than it used to be. So I think leaders need to be able to deal with uh, kind of embrace the information that's coming out rather than deny it. I mean, in the United States, we recently had this Twitter issue with a congressional representative. He denied, 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 and then admitted and is not, not going to be very good for him, I think. That would be my prediction. Um, so that, that's one thing, is I think, yes, you're right. There needs to be a new attitude um, that is um, more uh, accepting and more nimble with re regard to this transparency. 
Um, but the other side of it is that I think it's I think it's just a mistake for so much of the discussion about transparency to be about the transparency of government rather than government using its power to make other threats to society and citizens, in particular the behavior of corporations, other large organizations, more transparent, right? Those are two different things. So it's very easy for us to say government should be more open. It's a little bit more difficult for us to say, let's use the power of government to make all of these other entities which create threats to society more transparent. And I think, to my view, you know, from the perspective of a citizen, transparency should be focused on the greatest risks to me and other citizens, to society as a whole. And if I'm living in an authoritarian country or Bismarck, Germany, where most of the business is being done by government, then government is the main source of that risk. And I want government to be very, very transparent. All the energy should be toward government being more transparent. If I live now in Western Europe or in the United States, government does create some threats to me and my security but a lot of the threats do not come from government. They come from other large-scale actors. The E. coli in Germany was not created by a government agency in the first instance. It was created by a series of food producers. Maybe we should be focusing the lens of transparency on those. The car manufacturing defects in the United States where cars sped up and crashed, it wasn't government that created that risk. It was a series of car manufacturing decisions. Maybe those decisions and organizations should be more transparent. And the irony is, the more government is delegitimated, the less capacity it has to force those other organizations to become more transparent. I'm Sandra Bosman. I work also for the PBL. Um, Earlier in your presentation, you started about supply and demand, and you make the comparison with Amazon where people want to buy books and Amazon wants to sell books. And then you said, well, there are not, no politician, politicians who say, I want to give more influence to the people. So the, the, the supply, it, it doesn't come from the politicians. And then on, in all your examples that you later showed, it's not the the politicians that use ICT to influence polit politics, but it's, well, the public swear, the people. So I think that the supply of how to use more ICT in politics, it's not the politicians who do that, but the public swear that, yeah, in some way organizes itself. So I was wondering if you can give an, a new view on this supply and demand, mm -hmm. but then what's the supply and what's the demand if public swear organizes itself through ICT? Yeah. No, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, the why I put politicians as an essential part of the supply is that you know in my picture of democratic governance and politics, it's citizens want to influence the decisions of government, and that's a central mode of politics. And so that influence, the books are all held by politicians, right? And so, you know, one part of the response is there are politicians sometimes who, uh, who do want to uh, share power in that way. And so that was the example from Brazil and Belo Horizonte, right? Belo Horizonte. Um, the, but at least in the United States, most politicians do not. Um, they, they think it's their job to make those decisions. So that's one thing. And sometimes politicians uh, are the innovators, as in the Obama campaign, right? I think that's a very good example. They did use ICTs to mobilize in quite an effective way. And I think we'll continue to see lots of innovations in that mobilization way because the, the incentives are very high to make that work. The benefits are unambiguous, right? More money, more voters. So we'll see more of that happening. Um, but for me, in that first part of the talk, for a really big revolutionary change to happen, it has to involve more access uh, and more influence over public authority. That would count as a big change. And that's why all of the examples in the second part of the talk, I, in my mind, are more incremental and limited improvements. They're not so dramatic because you're right, it's the NGO thinking about how to adopt an effective technology, but there's a lot of steps between that NGO and the final 
in, in some policy or public action, right? They have to engage, fight with other NGOs who disagree with them. They have to fight with Martin or the parliamentarians, you know, whatever, trying to keep them at bay with a chair. Um, and, but finally, they may have some additional influence, but still it's a lot of steps and it's incremental. So I think you're right. They are part of the supply, but what they do is a, uh, in the middle of the chain rather than like Belo Horizonte with a politician who has final authority say over where this $10 million, $100 million goes, right? To me, that would be a more dramatic change. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Jaco Farla, Utrecht University. Um, in your story, I, I heard the idea that, uh, well, technology can enhance democracy. Um, and the basic idea is that um, the public has uh, benign motives. And I, yeah, and I was, uh, obviously you mentioned that at some web website uh, st stupid questions were asked. But in, in Holland we have one uh, website, it's called Geenstijl. Um, and they sometimes try to uh, stimulate uh, their viewers to make very stupid um, choices. So if there's a public uh, po possibility to make uh, some choices, they would um, uh, inform everybody to make the most stupid choice and that might come out of uh, such a public well, uh, influence. I was wondering, did you see that in, in for instance, Brazil or uh, and, and how do you think of that yes. possibility? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, no, we didn't see that in our research, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We picked very specific cases that were regarded as successes, right, by other people. And so we were looking for one kind of case where we thought there would be a lot of activity that would, was relatively successful that would then tell us about how these dynamics work. So nothing I've said addresses your question about whether the balance of technologies in the public sphere will operate to the good or bad, right? So there may be many other dynamics in which NGOs that are uh, on the wrong side of a bunch of these scientific questions, say, or, uh, or operate with anti-democratic agendas, they may be equally effective in using these IT ICTs along this dynamic or other dynamics. I don't know. I think it's a good question to ask and one that uh, you and I, all of us should ask as we continue to think through these issues. I haven't asked those yet. And so it may work out that um, these are, you know, the, those three examples of truth-based advocacy and mobilization. Um, and crowdsourcing, right? There may be uh, other dynamics that are even more powerful that uh, are, don't push toward more democracy and more accountability. They may, may push the other way. I just don't know. Yes, having a microphone, I'll take the opportunity as well. My name is uh, Albert Faber of PBL. Um, I was thinking, uh, uh, like in the, uh, uh, the early part of your presentation, you were looking for the, uh, let's say, the killer application that. Uh, of, uh, let's say in the political sphere, but what you see is a bit of follow-up uh, question of the previous one, is you see a lot of politicians use uh, social media as well, uh, uh, specifically Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, and now I was wondering uh, how you would assess uh, that uh, in terms of uh, uh, how the political sphere changes, and would you see that as, let's say, uh, some type of depoliticalization of politics in the sense that politicians become more accessible in a sense but uh, lose their, uh, let's say, their elite function of performing politics. Well, maybe uh, you have some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about that. I think it does contribute to mobilization and maybe to some, a little bit of transparency. Uh, but again, the benchmark in the first part of the talk was greater citizen influence and engagement. And I, I don't think it really has that effect. I think it's more like mobilization. You know, it's, it's relatively costless for the, the politician to engage in those social media efforts to get the word out, propagate the agenda, the message, the slogan, et cetera. I think it does very little to uh, increase the extent to which a citizen can either influence that politician or influence politics more broadly. I, I 
think that I, uh, I don't think it really fundamentally alters the role of the politician as, a, as an, uh, an elite actor with other politicians. I mean, it seems to me not that different from giving a speech at a town hall or uh, through mainstream media or other kinds of things. Because those, mecha those mechanisms, as I say, are not very interactive, right? They're more like broadcast mechanisms. I mean, there are many interactive mechanisms available with ICTs. It's just politicians don't use them very much. As far as I can tell, I mean, I'd love to hear counterexamples. Yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Hi, thanks. Uh, Sonja van der Arend, Delft University of Technology. Um, it seems you're rather strict on um, your judgment of if uh, a certain ICT app is uh, a killer app in, in the political realm. And the first, well, f firstly, I would question what did um, Facebook and, and other social media kill in the social realm? So did it kill much more than, for instance, uh, that newspapers are sort of killed or having a hard times, or at least quite sick, and I see them as party political uh, communication. Um, but more importantly, I think that you're judging quite harsh because you do not only want these apps to change political communication, you want them to be more democratic yeah, and that really yeah but it means a lot with you I heard liberating <laughs> legitimizing non elitist uh, you just add um, added um, what was it uh, citizen influence and there I should look it up there's some more that you got many many different definitions of the dem democracy um, and I do think ICT is changing the way politics is done and polit political communication is done uh, shouldn't that be enough? I mean, to, to say that it, that it is changing. Why should it be more democratic for you to, 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 to qualify as a killer app? Yeah. Uh, I agree with you that it is changing the way that politics is done. Um, but I'm, I, myself, am primarily interested in technology and politics uh, for its democratizing effects, right? I, I'm interested in improving the quality of democracy in the United States and, and everywhere else or contributing to that project. So for me, as a you know, scholar, that, that is my primary interest. Um, so, you know, that's just a question of, of purpose, I suppose, right? And, but there's a lot of reason to pursue that purpose because a lot of people had expectations, have expectations that, that technology will be democratizing in just those ways. And so it's important to answer with, uh, with some level of care whether or not that claim is true. And it's important to answer whether or not that claim is true, whether or not, or the ways in which te technology can be democratizing, whether it's in an incremental way or a more fulsome way. I mean, it's, it's just a question of purpose, right? I do agree that technology is changing interaction in all these ways um, and changing politics in all these ways. I was trying to think about what would count as a killer app in the technology space in my way, because I agree it's a high bar, right? And so here's what I came up with, an example, a fanciful example. So uh, in the United States, as perhaps here, Major parties have suffered a decline in legitimacy. People, many people in the electorate are no longer joining political parties, uh, not really voting even in major elections, right? Political parties are less able to legitimate than they once were. That seems to provide an opportunity. So imagine a, an ICT reinforced political party that would be the killer app. And what it would do is it would create a platform it's like participatory budgeting only for party politics. And it says, okay, you participate in our party, you join our party, you engage uh, through ICT mechanisms in wikis and voting and SurveyMonkey and all of these other things. And you develop the platform and whatever it is, we will fight for that thing, right? It's a fully democratized party in that sense some potential future. People like that because they feel like the mainstream parties are unresponsive. This party gets big, displaces some of the traditional parties because uh, their members feel that this ICT enforced party is more responsive. It wins elections, right? That would be, in my scenario, exactly a killer app in politics. That's, so it is a high bar. Yeah. 
No, you can't. No, because it has to be more. <laughs> well, you, you just speculated, so so now I'll hold it. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So I'm wondering, could I invite you to speculate a little more? And because I I really liked what you had to say, partly because it it agreed with my intuitions, which are nearly as developed as you made it. But that these changes are incremental, and that there's value in them, and that that's how things are going to change. So, but where I sort of question my own intuitions would be around two things. If I could briefly give two examples, one maybe you could think of from the energy field. Someone was mentioned that before. But when someone sort of reverses the way the current runs in the grid, something more maybe changes in that than just um, that they're they're saving some money. Their, their view of themselves as a producer, of how they relate, of their ability to, to be independent also shifts at that moment, right? And uh, similar kinds of things might happen around knowledge, where people actually contribute and see themselves, right? So that's one possibility. The, the other one happens in my house on a daily basis, right? Yeah, um, which is where I have a teenager, and, you know, now... It's, it's very typical that a, a group of them are there and they're sitting with each other, but they're also spending a lot of time on their computer, Skyping or what, uh, whatever the variant is, with other people, right? And we sort of get frustrated. You're here. Why don't you talking to each other? But they don't differentiate in the same way. And similarly, you know, often there's some person from the U.S. late at night there sitting at my breakfast table on Sunday morning, and I'm really not open to them being part of the Sunday morning routine, but again, my daughter doesn't, it, the, the difference between electronic and other forms of communication is just different to her. And the people who are using technology now, they're of a class, the politically active class, who didn't grow up with it in the same way and who still make differentiations that probably you make less than I do, and, but that are changing. And I wonder if we would actually see the killer app coming if it came. Right? No one saw Facebook, I don't think, as being it, as changing things in the way it did before and said, oh my God, look what's happening, better invest now. It, 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 it already had the moment you see it afterwards in retrospect. Yeah. So this is an invitation to sort of speculate about how that might develop with those two kinds of and probably other subtle shifts going on, but that could sort of change the ground in which this works. And we won't hold you accountable for yeah, that speculation. That's interesting. Well... I mean, that, that's what I kind of, that's what I didn't do in the first part of the talk, right? So I broke the an analogy by saying, look, here are the dynamics that explain the rise of Facebook and these other things. Those dynamics are not happening in the political sphere, right? So therefore, no analogy. And it may well be the case that these new modes of behavior enable other politically relevant dynamics to occur that will turn out to be really important. I think that's probably true. I have no idea whether that'll be in a more democratizing or less democratizing direction. Um, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. I think that the increased transparency has good and bad effects. I think that the uh, crowdsourcing, at least that tends in the direction of greater, ac more accurate social knowledge, whether it's of elections or, or noise or cancer clusters or environmental pol uh, air pollution around oil refineries, right? All of that is enabled by these new technologies. But their ultimate effects, I think, have to depend on how they mesh with organizations and organizational strategies. I, I just, I don't know, I hesitate to speculate. I mean, my method of making that speculation is to take a look at uh, the outlier, the high performers, and extrapolate from their, what they're doing. And that's what I tried to do with these cases in the global south. Um, but I agree, you know, that's not very much of an extrapolation. It's only a little bit. I, I'm afraid I can't do better at this point. <laughs> Sorry. My name is uh, Anne Breinsma. I work for the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Agriculture, and uh, Innovation. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. Um, but I would like to ask you if it's, uh, to consider the possibility that um, within your research you do uh, focus a little bit too much on the, on the current political system uh, and reality, because you leave the end of your, in, of your scheme, the, the end part was still uh, very much intact. What I would like to state is that, um, that I believe that government, one of the things that government is doing wrong, and public agencies as well probably, is that they're 
um, you know, they are uh, inviting, uh, they are trying to inv inv uh, involve people to the political realm where actually we should try and join the, the, the people's realm. And that, that would probably fundamentally change the, the political system as it, as it is right now. Maybe we don't even need political parties. Um, one um, additional observation or, or, or um, sentiment from my part is that um, what for me ICT and the Internet and open data is doing is um, that it, it's um, bringing to the light a fundamental, uh, the, the fundamental democratic deficiency uh, of the current system, where uh, Farid Zakaria called it in his book, The Future of Freedom, the, the, the tyranny of the minority. And just making, yeah, making this transparent will, I believe, um, make it possible that the majority will, you know, be uh, willing to uh, choose for strategic action, where you stated that the, the people will not be uh, interested in doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so in short, in short, I believe that technology will revolutionize politics and it is a matter of time. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, I think maybe it's revolutionaries who are utilizing technology that may revolutionize politics, right? So another mode of speculation is to look at where uh, the political innovation is happening. And I, I think you're right right that there is a lot of political innovation in so here's a here's another claim somebody who's a lawyer can see whether I'm right on this or not if you look at uh, the constitutions national constitutions have been written or revised after 1990 say Colombia Brazil South Africa many of these others they'll will incorporate many mechanisms for political interaction that operate much closer to where people are than our constitutions, um, than political, you know, representative government. That they have representative government, but they also provide for many and many other things, like empowered cities, like councils, citizen councils of many different kinds. And so I think that there is innovation in many of those spaces, and that um, technology can help reinforce those. But again, it's the meshing of technology and political will. And so what's distinctive there is that uh, in uh, these more innovative countries, politically, democratically innovative countries, is that politicians are trying to think about uh, how to make that transition, how to become much closer to people in their lives and integrating it with... Yeah, is, is that, tr well, I, no, I think it's a more circular process because, um, you know, the, the Brazilian things, if you look at some of these initiatives elsewhere in India, some of those are less technological, but they're on the democracy side. It's a virtuous cycle between civil society, between the public in different ways, making demands and then political innovations from the top down. So I guess I, I do not, I guess I'm not really on the side of things that thinks that uh, it will all, that all of the action is on the civil society side and at the grassroots level. But I think what's important is a virtuous cycle in which um, where the, the momentum and interest and priorities emerge from civil society, they have to be well articulated to the political structure much better than, at least in my country, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now, I would like to put forward an example of, uh, from my own current uh, work. I work at the Department of, um, how, how to translate that, the uh, program direction of, uh, well, I'm, I'm working at the Common Agricultural Policy, and I'm uh, responsible for the, uh, the civil dialogue. And um, I see two perspectives where, where the policy making process is, um, it's a very complex uh, 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 well, it's very complex, um, but no, but the interesting part is that it it lacks uh, legitimacy. So there is an, an uh, intrinsic 
uh, motivation from government to, to try and in, um, you know, uh, involve, uh, engage in, in civil dialogue. But what happens when we look at for, the, for this dialogue, um, what turns out is that there is a lot of, well, what turns to be true is the wisdom of the crowd. There are a lot of people that have very interesting ideas um, for uh, the future of, of, of agriculture and even broader, the, the future of our landscapes and, 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 and living... Um, um, I'm really looking for my words in English. It's very bad. I'm sorry. But, but and so on the one hand, you have all these people that are, uh, have a lot of good ideas and energy. And on the other hand, you have this, the current political system, which is unable to, to deal with, with all these good ideas. And it's a mismatch. But if I, if I would have to bet on the future, I would bet on the energy uh, and the, ener the, the, the good ideas existing in, in society and not on, you know, the current political system. <laughs> but but the, I think the political effort or the institutional effort to be, is to be able to figure out how to bring those two together, right? How to create a space that is more open and a set of actors that can hear these things in, uh, see, hear these demands and this energy in uh, a more articulate way. So there's a... Um, a uh, lawyer at Stanford Law School who did a study. In the, in the United States, there's a provision called notice and comment. You probably have it here, too, where uh, an agency puts out a regulation and then they have a period in which anybody can write in and comment on that regulation. And so he looked at a couple of big regulations and saw, analyzed all of the comments that came in. And what he found was it was literally the case that the people in the agencies could not hear the messages that came in unless they looked like a legal or regulatory memorandum, right? So if it looked like that, it didn't matter what the position was. It was the form, right? You know, the, if it came in that way, then they could take it into account. They could understand it. They could hear it. If it was, you know, written by me on a piece of paper, you know, a notebook paper, and had, they, they just couldn't understand it. You know, which just didn't process, didn't figure into their cognitive frame. And, but that's not necessarily the case, right? There are all sorts of reforms in which government, um, people working in government develop the skills and the capacity to hear in those ways, enable themselves to create the space, um, in which both sides feel comfortable having an interchange. And I think that is the way forward, is to meet halfway. Um, there's a very interesting analysis by a, a friend of mine, a very important scholar named John Gaventa on uh, theories of power. And he says there are three kinds of spaces in which these kinds of discussions occur. And he says there, there are closed spaces, which is what most of government is, right? They're closed to citizens and so on. And reformers, you know, my friends in government, what they do is they try to make those spaces into more invited spaces, which is what you are talking about, right? I'm government. It's a closed room. Next year, we're going to have a big reform, and we're going to open up that room and invite other people to come, and we'll talk to them, et cetera, right? For him, that's the middle kind of space. That's exactly this kind of space you were talking about, I think, right? He says there's a third kind of space, which is a claimed space, in which civil society organizations claim the space and make public officials or politicians come to their space and engage in these issues. They own the space. And there are lots of examples like that as well. And so I think maybe one strategy for uh, your kind of problem is to try to find organizations which are trying to claim spaces, working on your issues, and going to those spaces as well as inviting them to your spaces. What I would like to do, uh, Arkon, and, uh, and to you all, invite you to, uh, to uh, continue our conversation next door. It has been a delight to listen to you again, and I thought we are getting into a conversation that I hope we can continue for, for a bit. Um, let me first of all uh, thank Arkon for his excellent uh, presentation and stimulation. Okay. And, um, I know you uh, look at the self-presentation of this scholar and uh, you will find that he has a fascination for gadgets and he, he travels a lot and we don't want to add something to the Apple family but I ultimately, <laughs> ultimately feel that Apple I is just not it. It's, it's slick but it's not open source. So I predict we're going to leave that forum but this one 
this gadget is probably going to end in your suitcase all the time. <laughs> so I hope it works. Well, you can unpack it and they can check. And uh, I'm accountable for what I gave. Um, and to you all, if you, after the, 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 the drinks, will leave your badge that saves us some, uh, some resources uh, that we can then use for other purposes. This is the, uh, the Dutch uh, storm-proof <laughs> umbrella, which has Apple-like uh, qualities, I think. So <laughs> may I invite you all, and thanks once again, Arkham, for sharing your thoughts with us. Well, thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> You should, you should look at this. <laughs> <laughs> this is